welcome back for um, our wrap up, the USSC wrap up after day four of the Democratic National Convention, which was all streamed online this year. We're just going to check in with our experts again, have another conversation on on their reactions and what they think now that we've concluded uh, the DNC week and gearing up for the RNC next week. Um, so with me today again, I've got David Smith, senior lecturer in American politics and foreign policy, Brendan O'Connor, associate professor in American politics, Bruce Wolfe, non-resident senior fellow, and Kim Hogard, non-resident fellow with the center. So why don't we do it like last time, just start with you know a high or a low um, from the, we had today, but we didn't do the last couple of days as well. So if you want to touch on something from the convention as a whole and just focus on today, uh, that works. Why don't we do it in reverse order from last time? So Bruce, how about you, high and low? Uh, thanks and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I thought uh, Biden's speech today was uh, the high uh, because I think it uh, actually surprised people with its force and directness and uh, how he expressed what he's going to do. He says, we're, uh, we're gonna solve the virus, we're gonna bring the country together, we're gonna tackle racial justice, we're gonna end the recession. And I thought it was uh, just a very powerful, concise, focused message. I think, again, it surprises everyone. I don't know why Donald Trump thinks that uh, Biden is gonna come out on the stage in a wheelchair and dro drooling, and uh, he's lowered expectations so much that they are easily beaten, and, and, and Biden just put him away. And so I think that was fine. Yeah. Um, a, a, a low point, uh, there, there, there's one small thing missing. Hispanic Americans did not get much attention in this convention, and they're actually a very important constituency for uh, a lot of states, and so I think how that plays out is gonna be kind of interesting, but I, I don't wanna dwell on it. Um, other high points uh, was how effective, ultimately, the technology platform was, and I think uh, people were kind of pleasantly surprised uh, by how much they, uh, the diversity in it, how much you could show and communicate with. On the whole, I think the Democrats uh, f uh, will feel they had a, a very great week. And just one last point on Biden. He had to choose a vice president. He, choose, he chose her. He executed it extremely well. The Democrats had to have a convention. They did it. It was executed very well. Biden had to nail this speech tonight, and he did it, and he did it very well. So I think they really do feel quite good and ready to go and take Trump apart. Yeah, yeah, I think there were a lot of things that could have gone wrong, but it felt like there weren't any major hiccups or mistakes or issues, which was good. How about you, Brenda? What was your high and low from the convention? Uh, I was very taken by Barack Obama's speech. I mean, Michelle and Barack Obama, I thought, did a terrific mm -hmm. service uh, to their country. Uh, Obama, Barack Obama's speech really reminding us that the presidency is, is serious business. It's not just being faithful to the Constitution, it's rolling your sleeves up and getting into the details of issues. If you're gonna be briefed on foreign policy, if you're gonna be briefed on Russian behavior in Afghanistan, if you're gonna be briefed by health experts on the COVID-19, if you're gonna be briefed by experts on, the glo on global warming, you've gotta take this stuff seriously, you've gotta listen. Uh, you don't tune in to your favorite television station for information. And so I think those, those points were just very effectively made. Um, Biden's speech, as Bruce said, had a lot of, I think, vigor to it. Uh, he, I, he, he gave the impression that there was an audience there. Uh, he, but the disappointing side, I think, of some of the speeches was often a bit of lack of policy, a bit of a lack of sense that, well, what are people actually voting for? And that was, I think, a problem four years ago also, the sense that clearly there's a strong case to vote against Donald Trump, not just four years ago, but now on his record, um, a terrible record. But what are Americans actually voting for, apart from a promise to return to that Warren Harding word, normalcy, uh, um, or the sense that it will be America restored, or that America once again, maybe as Biden is trying to put this forward, will shine a light for the rest of the world. That, that's gonna take, I think, some convincing on the basis of, well, the light in what direction? What are the policies for the world, for America? Uh, so I think that that was something that, you know, it was probably a deliberate choice given the vulnerabilities of President Trump, given the moment we're living in. But I think, you know, it doesn't leave us with a lot to go on, on well, what, what, is, what exactly lies ahead? Yeah, there were a lot of moments that um, certainly pulled on the heartstrings. There was a lot of the ethos and passion and 
swelling music in the video montages. Uh, but I was hunting for the policy to find, oh, what is there to comment on? And you really kind of had to hunt for it. And it felt few and far between the references to actual policy. How about you, Kim? What was your high and low? Well, definitely um, uh, Vice President Biden's speech was definitely the highlight. Um, as has, has been pointed out, expectations have been set so low. Now, I think he just hit it out of the park um, tonight. He was very strong um, and consistent with the messages that we've been hearing throughout the week uh, about himself, about his character, about the type of person that he is, about the type of leader that would, he would be. You know, I think we come to the end of this convention and we can all say, everybody who's been watching, we know Joe. That's what they've been trying to do. Um, and uh, we know that Joe cares. They've certainly gotten that message across. And I have to say, even on a personal level, I really um, identified with the people, just the vox pops of normal people talking about how uh, they came across him and, and how he impinged on them and affected them. Um, because I, I didn't, didn't meet him personally, but I, was invited to attend the memorial service for James Brady, who was the press secretary to Ronald Reagan and my boss, who was shot in the assassination attempt. And he died, you know, just a few years ago. But even then the doctor, the doctors wrote on his death certificate that he died as a result of those wounds. But at that memorial service in Washington, which I flew back for, um, Joe Biden spoke at, at it. Just a few people spoke. And I have to admit that up until that point, I had sort of a, an opinion about him that was a bit cynical and, you know, you know, thinking about his gaffes, the kind of politician, you know, that he was and a longtime politician. But I was completely, my impression was completely changed on that day. He spoke without notes for quite some time, quite personally, caringly, um, deeply, uh, and knowing the Bradys closely because of their advocacy for gun violence, uh, against gun violence and gun control through the Brady Foundation. So it was such a, it, it was an indelible moment for me. So I related to a lot of these people who have had these indelible moments with Joe Biden. And I thought that came through, at least it came through to me because I could relate to it. So I definitely think his, his speech was a highlight uh, today. I think it capped off an incredible week for the Democrats. I think, sorry, Brendan, but welcome to the 21st century. I hope they do this all the time now because it's so much more interesting and I understand what everybody's saying about not having uh, a sense of the policies, but I think over the four days, we got a really good sense of the policies because they hammered them home every time. And we had these visuals and these backups and things that we saw during this week, we'd never see during a, a traditional convention. And I, as the Washington Post wrote today, you know, it should win an Emmy award just for the production. And I agree with it completely. And I think Julia louis Dreyfus should win an Emmy Award because she was that was that was an incredible way to finish the convention. Having this person who played the Veep, but to send up the president and to have Sarah Cooper on there. Yeah, Sarah Cooper up, for her. <laughs> yeah, the president. That was that was incredibly brave. But I think they carried it off. And I, well, I think Ju Julia carried it off, definitely, which I'm not sure anybody else could have done. So for me, the highlights were the humor and, and uh, Vice President Biden's speech. Yeah, well, humor is incredibly challenging uh, in the best of circumstances, but even more so over a virtual platform. And I wonder if it will be hit or miss or whether it will have resonated widely. I'll be interested to hear the different views on that. How about you, David? What was your high and low? I thought that the highlight of today, as good as Biden's speech was, uh, was Braden Harrington, a uh, boy with a stutter, who talked about his connection with Biden based on the fact that they both stuttered. 
the incredible bravery of that speech was really remarkable. And certainly, as far as conventions go, I can never remember a moment um, connecting with people with disabilities in that way. I mean, if you want to talk about forgotten people, often people with disabilities feel so overlooked and so ignored. And there are always nods to people with disabilities, often involving, um, you know, heroic veterans in wheelchairs, things like this, uh, very visible heroes. To have someone struggling with a condition that so many people struggle with that usually isn't publicised, that is not going to get you any medals, um, that's something that you, you know, you just have to overcome in the way that Biden did. I, I've never seen anything like that at a convention before. And um, I thought that that was a very powerful moment. And it's one of those moments which that goes, I mean, that was a lot more important than any possible political benefit it will bring to the Democrats. That was important in terms of the effect that it would have had on, uh, on a lot of people in the audience who were dealing with similar things. Yeah, it felt very human and very relatable. Yeah. Um, another highlight of the convention, which hasn't been mentioned yet, was the day two roll call. Um, I agree with Kim in general about the, the superiority of an audienceless convention, especially here. This is how every roll call needs to be done from now on. Uh, yeah. usually, usually roll calls are fairly unwatchable affair. I mean, they're very important. As, uh, as the great political scientist VOK said, the National Party only becomes the National Party in the moment of the roll call. So they're very important things, and usually they're not a lot of fun to watch. This was fantastic. Um, states did, I mean, some of them did terrible jobs which were entertaining to watch, uh, as entertaining as the ones who did a good job. My very favourite one was the college student in Montana who was standing on a windy hill and you could barely hear her voice and there's a herd of cattle uh, in the background. <laughs> that was um, uh, that was fantastic. Another thing about today was the amount of religion, which um, for the Democratic Party, certainly in my time of watching conventions, I've never seen that much both explicit and implicit uh, religious content in a convention before, and I thought that that was a very good thing. Even though Democrats often get stereotyped and to some degree self-stereotype as the secular party, it is important to remember that half the party is actually quite religious. And uh, I think it was, it was quite important to have those components. In terms of uh, convention lowlights, Mike Bloomberg. Um, <laughs> what does the, Democrat, no, what no, does the no. Democratic Party owe him that they gave him a slot that prominent. Mike, put up the billion dollars. Well, um, he has, he has. And that's why right. they gave, that's why they gave him that spot. He's, no, he's, a billion. He's, he's funding all these down ballot races. He's funding he's giving, all, you know. That's right. He's giving $60 million to the Democrats yeah. for house races. And he, that's why his candidates were the difference in between winning and losing in 20, 2018. Yes, yes, a, because, a yeah. Billion, a billion minus 60 million is 940 million. It could be worth a could be worth a Fed seat in a in a in the in the uh, Biden presidency. Well, we'll we'll see about that. Um, <laughs> other other lowlights. I would have liked to see more organised labour. I would have liked to see more organised labour leaders rather than just the brief roundtable that Trump did with some rank and file unionists. Organised <laughs> labour leaders are very important to the Democratic Party coalition. And uh, I thought, frankly, that that was a bit of a snub. Well, they, well they, had, they had all the, Cory Booker introduced all those union workers. I mean, I know it was just a bunch of vox pops and interviews, but you know, they had an auto worker, a firefighter, a, a bus driver. I mean, to me, they tried to cover everything in these last four days. And, and, and today, not only did we have the unions, but, um, you know, addressing civil rights and having the, the former Surgeon General on there to, to address science and, and, and believing in the truth and, and believing that the, the virus is, is real um, and his own personal story. I mean, 
yeah, I, th I think that and, and the uh, attention to military service, uh, having Pete Buttigieg and um, uh, uh, Tammy Baldwin on to, to represent the LGBTQ, LBGTQ uh, section of the population of the, of the, the party. I think they, they really hit just about everyone, even Hispanics the other day. But what, one, one, play, one thing I wanna uh, give a shout out to is really day three, because that was the day of women. That was the day that you know, Kamala Harris uh, received the formal nomination, but also it, it was all about the women and it was all about women's issues, even though all issues are, uh, all women's issues are everyone's issue. Um, and then all four days, we've had female moderators. I really think they're, they, they, they uh, endeavored to make the entire convention female focused. And I think they, they did an excellent job at that. And I just want to give it a shout out to day three because uh, even though President Obama uh, really almost stole the show from Kamala, um, it was a pretty incredible, uh, pretty incredible recognition on that day. Yeah, well, I think a couple of the clear, you're touching on some, some of those strategies that we saw, like in terms of how they were profiling women and representing women, the role of that in the convention. And also to David's point about the role of religion in day four of the Democratic National Convention, that was clearly very thought out. There was a plan for it. One thing I just want to touch on quickly, David, I think you mentioned that Trump had a round table with union leaders but I'm assuming you meant Biden, just to oh, yes. <laughs> just, I was like, I think I missed that part of the convention. That would be very unconventional. Yes, no, no, they did, no, sorry. I didn't even realize uh, that I said that, no, uh, Biden. Uh, oh. I'd like to come back to uh, what Brendan and uh, Kim said, uh, the Obama speech, because I really do think, you know, in, in, I think Democrats feel good and they're somewhat optimistic, but Obama, I think it's one of the most important speeches I've ever heard because yeah. he really uh, crystal crystallized a moment in America's democracy that is decisive. And a sense that if um, this fails and Trump is reelected, that the, the future of the country, it's an existential issue for the country as we know it and have known it. And, I, um, and so you go from a feeling of, of a high, you know, it's gonna be fine to one of terror that actually things could fall apart. And uh, so, uh, and I think this, this is gonna be with us. I think the days before the vote are going to be among the tensest we've ever lived through, short of being in a hot war with uh, the Nazis. So it's really, I think this is quite a moment uh, in our lifetimes uh, in American history. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think to follow up, one of the things that was crucial was this focus constantly on getting out to vote, the right to vote, and attempts to stop people from getting out to vote. Um, you know, messing with the postal service, with uh, you know the ability of people to vote early or vote on the day. So that that message, I think, was very effectively put across from a number of people, including Obama. And Ob the other thing about Obama's speech that I thought was really powerful that you saw in some of the little sort of documentaries or the little video segments in the conference was Obama's real focus on activism, on a sense that politics is about this hard boring of sort of hard boards as Weber saw it, this very slow process of dedication. And there's obvious references constantly to John Lewis in that regard, the civil rights movement, that getting out there and doing things that make a difference. And one of the things Biden has wanted to highlight in that regard is the sort of his actions on violence against women. There was an excellent short presentation on his role in legislation on that issue with uh, a variety of very brave women who spoke that was powerful. And those kinds of things, I suppose, remind us that politics at its best makes a huge difference in people's lives, and the Democrats can, these are things they can be proud to be on the right side of. And so for me, that did really add some heft to this convention that you don't get with the balloons and the pageantry because there's somber messages quite often and they're not rah, rah messages, but you know, those were the things that I came away with thinking, well, this is a party that you know, certainly has a proud record to run on, 
and Biden, when he picked upon those sort of triumphs and those connections, seemed a stronger candidate to me. Hmm. And to Kim's point about, you know, the role of women in the convention, it, what's your take on, you know, the, the way that the Democrats designed it and pulled off that strategy? Was it effective? Was it different to other conventions? Like, just what's your thought on, in, in particular, how they profiled and used the voice of women, obviously trying to win women and other voters? Um, how did you feel about that strategy? Uh, well, being the woman, can I go first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Look, I think, I, I think it's brilliant. Um, I, and, and clearly, they are the Democrat Party is recognizing that women are the ones that vote them into office. So why not appeal to your strongest, the strongest part of your base? Um, and I thought all of the women uh, that were on, st on, on TV over the last four days were, incre were in remarkable women. What great role models for younger people watching this. Um, and the fact that they used young and old and in between, but you know, watching Elizabeth Warren speak about childcare or Nancy Pelosi being referred to as Madam Speaker and, and uh, talking about what, what was her line, who's standing in the way, two men, Mitch McConnell and, and Donald Trump. Um, and, and as Brendan pointed out, talking about the Violence Against uh, Women Act and talking about domestic violence and giving it the platform it should have um, to educate people and to remind people that it was Joe Biden that first, first you know, helped get that through. But then Hillary Clinton and talking about women's rights and even the immigrant stories, telling them from women's points of view or from a female, a small uh, child, a small girl losing her mother. I mean, all of those stories. And, and then even starting out with uh, the governor of New Mexico standing in front of a solar farm to say, this is what we could, this is what it could look like. All of these women are telling us all of these issues and all of these policies that the Democrats stand for, uh, but also putting them in the context of these are national issues like childcare should be part of our infrastructure as, as Elizabeth Warren pointed out. So, and then of course they also had the gun um, opened up on day three with gun violence, but, uh, and, and, and having victims uh, and Gabrielle Giffords, you know, how poignant her playing the French horn uh, and then speaking when we when we rarely hear her give a speech like that, finding fighting to find the words to speak up, that was very inspiring. So all of all of the performances by all the women, whether they were elected or unelected or Fox Pops, I thought were really really inspiring. And to me, the whole four days, I think they they were just they were highlighted throughout. It, it's it's it was the women's convention. Mm, and. You know, it, it's interesting in that last bit you mentioned, you know, the, the women's performances. I feel like one of the big differences between this convention and others that I've watched is it felt like a series of performances, whereas I don't know I would always say that. Like often it maybe feels like a series of speeches um, or you've got things where they mix it up, but I would rarely lean into the term performances, but that's the term I keep coming back to with this convention. Does, is that, does that resonate with you guys? Is that your sense as well? Was it different or was that, did you feel, feel or categorize it differently? Uh, it, coming back to something that Kim said earlier about welcome to the 21st century. In a way, this convention was actually like welcome to the 20th century. I mean, conventions prior to this have had very much a 19th century structure. You know, they actually do harken back to the times when William Jennings Bryan could get the Democratic nomination by making a particularly powerful speech saying, you shall not nail us to a cross of gold. Mm. Um, the, the, I mean, obviously things have changed a lot. The impact of televising it has changed a lot. The changes to nominating rules have changed things, the widespread use of primaries. But despite all of those things, we were still getting this package based on in-person speeches in front of large crowds that were, you know, that comes from the days when it was a completely different political process 
that led to the nomination. I'm not saying you have to throw that stuff out altogether, but this is actually the kind of convention that you would have designed if it had been a television spectacle from the beginning that is produced in a certain way. Basically a huge amount of control uh, over every segment. I mean, you, you can still at conventions in recent years, there have been really notable moments when things have gone very wrong. I think of Ted Cruz's speech uh, at the 2016 Republican National Convention. There was basically almost no chance that anything could go wrong um, at this. As you say, it was this real performance. Probably, I don't know if the majority of things were pre-recorded, but it looked like the majority of things were pre-recorded. Basically, the, the, the producers, the script writers, and the people speaking themselves were able to exercise maximum control over what was going on. And as Kim pointed out on day one, this had the look of something that was very, very well planned. Um, so, yes, I think seeing it as a series of uh, kinds of, yeah, discrete performances, um, I, th I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. Hmm. And if, oh, sorry, what were you going to say, Bruce? Well, I, I, I was going to ask, what do you think? So what do the Republicans do next week after absorbing all this? It's going to be so interesting to see what they come up with. Yeah, well, I, I have no idea myself. It's really hard. I, I know it'd be Trump centric, but beyond that, how they do it, I don't know. It's really going to be something. Well, we've seen they're, they're putting in people who have basically gone viral by making public asses out of themselves. <laughs> we, we've got the drinking barefoot uh, gun couple from Missouri who pointed weapons oh. at Black Lives Matter. I, I call them Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> you know, we've, we've got the, the kid who became famous for getting into a public standoff with a Native American activist uh, while wearing a MAGA hat. I mean, this is, this is who they I don't know what they're going to have them saying. But, doing. but they'll, have, they'll have Vice President punts. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that I think, David, you, what you're talking about, you know, highlights what we might be able to anticipate is one thing Trump just seems to always do is get a good headline, like to, you know, disrupt something to the point where it's like you can't not report it or you have to cover it. So if those are the people that are going into the lineup, then I think one thing that we can expect is they're going to aim to dominate the news cycle by whatever means necessary. And he's been continuously effective at that. I mean, four years later, I did not think we would still be having Trump in the headline almost every single day. So I don't know what they'll do, but I imagine shock and awe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then one of the Sorry. I suppose one of the problems of having a really negative set of arguments, though, that you saw four years ago is that Trump is now the president. He now has a record to defend. So running as though you're an outsider, that you're not the incumbent, running that you're running against the government, you're running against all sorts of interests in your society is harder to pull off when you're the president. So the sort of darkness of the 2016 convention, which was a very negative convention on many fronts. There wasn't much talk of sort of, you know, America being a role model in the world. Uh, the, the platform that the Republicans had was basically what Romney had four years ago, but hardly any of that, which was in the online platform was actually spoken at the convention. It was just the Trump people didn't have the resources or energy or, or intellect to have their own platform. But if you listen to the speeches, which I put myself through, there was this kind of constant negativity about where America was at at that time. And that I think will be much harder, you know, there's many reasons to be negative at the moment, uh, with, you know, 100, what, 175,000 people now have died in the United States of COVID-19. But how you present this as making America great again, uh, this is gonna be incredibly challenging. So it will get the headlines, There'll be all sorts of wacky performances. There'll be a lot of negativity, but is that really going to be very effective when you are the president? I, I suspect in terms of how to package this, I suspect we might see a lot of stuff that looks a bit like the 700 club. Um, I mean, tr there's a lot made of Trump's evangelical support base. What is not so often pointed out that is very important is that's overwhelmingly a charismatic and Pentecostal support base. And uh, I mean, Trump has a lot of allies who are televangelists. 
I expect we're going to see a lot of stuff borrowed from uh, tele-evangelical uh, kind of production values. I think there'll be a lot of emphasis on whether they say it explicitly or not. Trump is a fulfillment of prophecy and you need to uh, fulfill God's word. You need to make God's word happen by re-electing Trump. I will be very interested to see if there are any nods to the other prophetic wing of the party, which is QAnon, which uh, Trump openly kind of nodded at this week. Uh, he basically said something to a journalist which would have convinced his QAnon followers that what they believe is true, that he is saving the world. That is something that would have sent his campaign managers and political allies probably uh, would have given them heart attacks, but at the same time, uh, I think they're locked in now to having to uh, to court this this group. So it'll be interesting to see whether there are any uh, any nods to them as well. Hmm. I, I would, sorry, I would add to that that next week, Nancy Pelosi is going to start uh, their investigations and uh, the post with, office and yes. on the post office. Hmm. We've also had the Senate Intelligence Committee report come out this week. Uh, looking at Russian interference in the election and put, you know, putting to bed any issues around whether you, Ukraine was involved in that. And certainly, uh, I would hope that next week we'd see a bit more attention on that, that it deserves to have. Um, of course, now we've had the um, arrest of Steve Bannon. That will still also be in, uh, in the spotlight, I would imagine. And, and I would just say, if for the Republicans to try to follow up this convention, in which they haven't had the time to prepare like the Democrats have, I, I would almost, if I were conducting it, I would almost say, cut it in half. Mm -hmm. Just do a, what, what do you, why do you, you don't need it. The president basically is overexposed. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain amount of that, that is, is a, it's a detriment to a candidate. I mean, this whole pandemic has played so well for Joe Biden. And I've, I've said from the beginning, being in his basement has been a good thing for him. Uh, he hasn't had to do much. He could just yeah. let Donald Trump open his mouth. So he doesn't have to do so much work and he needs to pace himself. And, I, and hopefully they've got enough people, you know, along through the rest of this campaign that he can do that. But, but the president is overexposed. He's every day out there, he's been campaigning already. So we're not gonna hear anything new next week. We already know what he's going to say in terms of, uh, he's already been trying to outline his successes over, over, the term, you know, over his term so far with the, the stock market, which he has nothing to do with, um, or however he wants to interpret COVID numbers. So I, there's nothing new there. I think you know, he's already stolen Ronald Reagan's uh, slogan, campaign slogan of Make America Great Again. He's, he's already stolen the, the songs that they use, Lee Greenwood. I mean, I can't stand that song anymore. I heard it so much back then, <laughs> you know. And, so, and, and plus, no musician is letting the ca Trump campaign use license, get the license to use their music. So I, I don't know. I think I would, just, I would just be cutting it in half and saying, I'm the president. I've got to, you know, I've got to go on and, and, and run the country. And then I... I'd be a little less exposed, but that's impossible with him. I think, well, there's I going think to be no know. morning in America, is there? <laughs> that's, right. that's not going to be the campaign no. song. No. Maybe morning with a U. But, uh, yeah. I, th I think I think uh, I think uh, Kim that uh, Trump would be well advised to listen to you, but he doesn't believe in overexposure. I mean, I, he, I he, he just he just <laughs> believes the more hours that he is on te television in some form, even if it's terrible news, even if he's being questioned about Steve Bannon being arrested. He sees that as a positive yeah. deal. Um, yeah. I just looked up some ratings uh, because at the end of the day, the question, this election, because it comes down to what Obama, it comes down to who's going to vote. So how many people were influenced? I mean, I think the political class that watched this gives it to the Democrat. They say they had a very good week, but are Amer does America give it to the Democrats? Mm -hmm. And do they think it? So just some numbers on ratings. So the first night was 19.7 million. It dropped to 19.2 on Tuesday. And last night was um, uh, about 22, 22.8. So it came up, but that's off 
by at least a third from 2016, where mm -hmm. the, the total ratings, all the networks pay and network were closer to 30. Yeah. So, so is there anything you think Australia needs to learn from this or anything Australia might want to have in mind when it comes to their next election? Australia solved the problem, mandatory voting. <laughs> yes. That, 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 that has solved the problem. So it doesn't matter whether you watch or don't watch, you got to vote and then you have to educate yourself. And a strong press. And, yeah. and a strong press. Uh, so, so really though, the question is, uh, does this, will this really affect turnout in November? I think that is the question. Hmm. And what do you think the answer is, Bruce? I don't know. I'm, I'm afraid. I hope for the best, but I'm afraid for the worst. I really am. And, and that, Obama scared the hell out of me. And hmm. uh, and uh, we won't know the answer until we see the result. Don't you think this week, though, motivated people to to, to vote? I mean, the whole three o three three o. And Julia Louis Dreyfus's whole thing on that. But don't you think that that sort of make a plan, make a plan to vote? But based on the ratings, did they hear it? Yeah. And well, as far as well, I, that... Bruce, I agree with you. But one caveat to that is, or two, two caveats. One is, it is possible that a lot more people were watching it on Facebook. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So That's the what social I was media numbers say. are not included in that, right? Yeah. Second, second thing is, I suspect a lot of this stuff would have been made with a view to what can be repackaged into 30 second clips or one minute clips or two minute clips that subsequently have an afterlife on the internet. Because, you know, when we're even a well watched convention, say one that got 30 million people, you know, that's 10% that's of the population. Now though, there would conceivably be far more people who see whatever viral, in the same way that people used to see a lot of stuff on the evening news that they might not have necessarily seen it. And it was what happened on the evening news was what was important. Like LBJ's famous Daisy ad, which only ever screened once in one market, but was then given blanket coverage on news networks. In the same way, it's about they would have been looking to create uh, moments that, could, that can be made into viral packages. I suppose we'll have to see uh, over the next few days and weeks whether uh, any of those actually hit and have the impact. I suspect that's one of the reasons why they were using comedians so heavily um, tonight. Um, but I think that that might be, I, I agree with what you're saying about the ratings, but that might be, uh, I think that would have been another consideration. And then we'll see the polls next week. That'll tell us whether, how much of an impact it had. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's all we've got time for um, today, guys. But ugh, fascinating. It's just uh, very interesting to be on the other side of this convention. Another week has kind of gone by in this year that is 2020, which just continues to surprise us. We'll look out for the polls next week and we'll be following the Republican National Convention next week. Um, and then after that, we're getting into debate season. So stay tuned for more from the USSC and thank you all for your time.